Captain Midnight. This video is brought to you by Ting Mobile. So years ago, I made a really negative video about Justice League. The theatrical cut is a lifeless Frankenstein's monster of a movie. Welded together from existing footage and reshoots, it felt like a highly compromised film from the start. It wasn't until the release of the Snyder Cut though that we all had a chance to see exactly how compromised, and some of the baffling choices that Warner Brothers and Joss Whedon made to alter the film. I'll be honest though, I was never that much of a Snyder fan. I was lukewarm on Man of Steel and thought Batman vs Superman was pretty bad, though I'll admit the Ultimate Edition at least did make it feel like a coherent movie. So while I was happy that the Snyder Cut would exist for those fans desperate to see it, it wasn't really something I was anticipating. But then I liked it. I don't think it's perfect by any means, and some of the problems I had with it from the theatrical cut still remain, like Superman's quick reversal back to being a good guy just after seeing Lois, which felt pretty lazy and unearned to me in theaters, and still does. Though I will say giving Superman some extra scenes and the use of the amazing Man of Steel score did make that all go down a bit smoother. Overall, I think the Snyder Cut is a really solid and personal, if bloated, superhero film. And if this is his last DC film, I think it's great that he went out on a high note and that he had so much creative control. But I didn't just want to do a general review video this week. I actually wanted to focus on one particular aspect of the film that spoke to me the most, and the part that was basically ripped out wholesale from the theatrical cut. The story of Victor Stone. My magic lasso will help me save that sinking ship. Now obviously, there's been a lot of behind the scenes issues with Joss Whedon and Warner Brothers, who Ray Fisher and others have said created a terrible and even discriminatory work environment. This isn't a video about that, though I definitely encourage you to look into it. No, this is a video about Cyborg, who I think is the heart and soul of the Snyder Cut. You know, after walking out of the theatrical version, the idea that DC was actually going to make that announced Cyborg movie just seemed really stupid. Like he was barely a presence in the film, mostly there to flatly state exposition and talk about the mother boxes. Not exactly a take on the character that I was excited to see again. But the Snyder Cut adds so many new cyborg scenes that it totally recontextualizes the ones that we already had. So many of the characters in the Snyder Cut of Justice League are wrestling with how they feel about their parents or how their parents feel about them. Superman hears his Earth parents and his Kryptonian father in the Fortress of Solitude. Flash keeps putting his life on hold to help his father in prison, despite his father's wishes. And Batman, well, I mean he's Batman. But Cyborg's story especially highlights this. At the beginning of the film, or I guess like an hour or two into it, who Victor is before the accident is set up really efficiently. He does some smart Ferris Bueller-ian grade hacking, but to help out a friend who's having a tough time, and he's the captain of the football team. But from the start, his relationship with his father Silas is strained. At first it seems like the cliché, his dad is a workaholic type thing that you would see in every 90s movie, but after the accident, I think things get a lot more interesting. We see Silas's grief after the death of his wife, and his determination to keep his son alive. Which is completely understandable, but by doing so, he chooses this life as a cyborg that Victor himself never had any say in. I still don't like the heavy CG look of Cyborg, like I definitely prefer the more practical, low budget take on his costume that you see in Doom Patrol, but in the context of the Snyder Cut, it does kind of work. It really makes it feel like Victor has been fully enveloped by this machinery, and that his dad had to sacrifice so much of what made Victor human in order to keep him alive. People react to him like a monster, and I think expanding on those body horror elements could have made for a really great cyborg solo film. The sequence where Victor discovers what his powers can do is one of my favorites in the entire 4 hour runtime. Zack Snyder's DC films have always had this intense focus on the burden of power, and Cyborg is another expression of that. Silas didn't just save his life, he also gave him more power than anyone should ever have. I mean think about it, Silas gave his grieving son the power to launch nukes with zero oversight. That's pretty insane. 
This version of the film makes it a lot more clear just how powerful Cyborg is. His physical strength is a pretty small part of the equation actually, compared to how he seems to literally have the power to reshape the global economy or destroy the world if he chooses to. We see him test out his power by giving a woman thousands of dollars through his manipulation of the ATM, choosing to help people even as he's being glared at on the street. All this sets up a great origin story that I think could have led to something more in a really interesting way. The fact that DC had a cyborg movie announced and everything, and still decided to take out these scenes that would actually get people invested in seeing one, is just really weird to me. I mean, even Cyborg's interactions with the rest of the cast are really improved here. I like how instead of just tolerating each other like they did in the theatrical cut, Arthur and Victor actually develop a real friendship over the course of the film. The characters actually being invested in each other as people leads to much better group scenes, like when Aquaman angrily says that Victor's dad would still be alive if they hadn't decided to resurrect Superman. It's those kind of moments where the characters actually have strong opinions and disagree with each other that gives the team some actual texture, that highlights their unique perspectives instead of just making them feel like a group of interchangeable action figures posing for the camera. I still don't love Ezra Miller as Flash. Fair or not, I just find it kind of an irritating performance. But I thought he was at his best when paired with Cyborg or Batman, whose deadpan deliveries at least work with Flash's more hyperactive personality. The whole team is a lot easier to get invested in in this version, and most of those group scenes really did need to stay in the film for it to work. The climax of the film sees Victor and the team actually fail, and Flash having to enter the Speed Force to reverse time. And for one brief moment, in Victor's mind at least, he's in his old body. At first, this looked like it was going to be a scene about Victor making peace with the loss of his parents to their face, but I really liked that it turned out to be something a little bit more sinister, a last ditch effort to keep him distracted. It's not exactly subtle, but there is something really interesting and even kind of moving about Cyborg having to literally reject his old life outright and embrace his new one in order to save the world. Cyborg listening to his dad's taped explanation of his powers and then crushing the device completely was a great moment and maybe the best piece of acting that Fisher does in the movie. It also sets up that recording to be the narration before the epilogue. And this is what really sold me on Cyborg being the heart of the film. Of every storyline in this movie, I think his resonates the strongest, and the way his father's recording is used to reflect on the other characters' journeys as well ties the movie together thematically in a way that the theatrical cut just never bothered with. Combine that with the Cyborg that we get in this movie's bizarre epilogue, and I was really excited to see what was next for the character. Of course, Warner Brothers doesn't seem interested in continuing with that ending, and Fisher doesn't want to work with Warner Brothers under the leadership that it has now. So seeing any more of this take on the character feels pretty unlikely at this point. That's kind of frustrating, because even though the upcoming Flash movie does sound interesting with its inclusion of multiple Batmen, it's Cyborg that I found myself wanting to see more of once the credits had rolled. In the theatrical cut, I thought Fisher's performance felt bored and perfunctory, but here I got a much different sense, a stoic man who had had so much taken away from him, including most of his own body, and is just doing the best he can to barely hold it together. And being able to expand on that in a script that really takes advantage of how psychologically complex this character has the potential to be, I think could be really amazing. In the end though, I'm just glad that Zack Snyder's Justice League exists. I was not the kind of diehard fan who just had to see this version, but I ended up being glad that I did. While not without its flaws, Snyder's Justice League is not only a more entertaining version of this story, it also made clear how much potential there was in these versions of the characters. I always thought that Affleck's Batman at least deserved his own movie, and I still feel that way. But it was Cyborg who surprised me the most here. And I'm glad he did. Cyborg, what happened back there? Get off my back. Anyone who has seen the theatrical version of Justice League knows how it feels to get ripped off, which is pretty much what the experience has in common with paying your cell phone bill. Thankfully, there's Ting Mobile. Ting gives you something that so many other cell phone plans seem to want to take away, flexibility. 
Their Flex Plan is perfect for low data users and families. You only pay $5 per gigabyte that you actually use each month. So if you use less, you pay less. And data usage is shared across all lines on one Ting account, which means the more lines you add, the more you save. And if you need more data, they've got you covered too. You can get 5 gigs for only 25 bucks a month and unlimited plans start at only $45. Switching isn't a hassle either, it works with almost any phone and you can keep your phone number. You don't need to worry about coverage because Ting is partnered with some massive US networks. I'm not really supposed to mention them, but you probably know the ones. Not only can you pay less every month, you can also call Ting's customer service and expect an actual human being to pick up right away. You could also email or jump into their subreddit or even discord. There will always be someone there to help. That's why I'm switching to Ting. See how much you could save by going to midnight.ting.com and get $25 off your phone bill right now. That's midnight.ting.com. Here's a special tip for the fellas and girls who have not already joined Captain Midnight's new 1940 flight patrol. You'd better hurry up and join at once because there's a big adventure ahead. The thing to do now is to get started. Because we're going to have not only barrels of fun, but loads of free gifts and prizes too.